What is the roadmap to defeat self-sabotage, negative thinking, and learned helplessness? In these unprecedented times, you must get connected, get growing, get certain, and get attitude. The Get Attitude Podcast. And welcome to the GAP. We are here with an unreal guest and an unreal podcast just for you. If you're a person that is looking to increase the culture, if you're a person that's constantly bitching about your workplace or your work, we have somebody for you who can help. She wrote the book, Winning the Game of Work. She's an executive consultant and executive coach. And uh, we want to welcome you to the Get Attitude Podcast, the award-winning Get Attitude Podcast. Jason, are we live or are we not live? I'm just curious. Oh, we're live. And when we go live, do we actually have the intro when we go live for yeah. people? Oh, sweet. Uh-huh. I like that. Did you like the intro? Oh, well, so anyway, guys, look it. I'm Glenn <laughs> Bill. Squirrel. Squirrel, I'm Glenn Bill. We're here with Jason Aaron, and we are here to help you get attitude. We are here to help you bridge the gap from who you are to who you want to become. And you know what? We got we got a good one today. Terry Boyle McDougal. Terry, welcome to the Get Attitude Podcast. Glenn, it's great to be here. I like it. Now, do you do a lot of podcasts? I know I got you off up on Podbooker, but are you uh you do you have a podcast and are you guesting on yes. a lot of them? I have a podcast. It's called Marketing Mambo. I talk to uh, marketing leaders and people that work around the world of marketing from around the world. And I have been on probably 150 podcasts. Oh my gosh. Since I started getting into it. I mean, I, I actually thank the pandemic for getting me into podcasting because my book unfortunately came out the month after the shutdown oh my God. and uh, I needed to find an alternative way besides book signings and uh, my launch party that I had planned to get the word out. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. So uh, your podcast is about marketing. Is that correct? It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's about marketing and it's about life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a curious person. I like to hear people's stories and you know, the, the thing that they all have in common is that they work in or around the world of marketing. That was my career before I became a coach in 2017. I like it. So when we think of, we have a lot of business owners that are on here. When we think about marketing, even though this is about attitude, but since we got one of the influencers and leaders in this subject, what is marketing? What do you teach your people that marketing is? Marketing is about understanding what the target audience needs and sort of building a bridge between what you have and trying to influence them to take action. So, you know, it's funny because I, it took me a while after I became a coach to realize that I'm doing the same thing now that I did when I was a marketing leader, which is trying to understand what someone's problem is building a roadmap of how to get there and then taking action to make it happen. That's what you do in marketing and that's what you do in coaching. Well, and that's what you do in life, isn't it? I mean, I always say uh, everybody has two things in common, problems and relationships. Yeah. And most of our problems are because of our relationships when it's all said and done. (laughs) So, so uh, we are all marketing, not only in business, but we're marketing in personal life. And uh, so. That's why I'd love to get your perspective on this thing called attitude. What What's your definition of attitude? It's the way that you see the world. Cool. Cool. It's the lens, the lens that you use through which to see the world. And I think a lot of times people don't realize that they've got a choice about that lens. Many people don't realize that they're looking through, say, a dirty window at the world, but you can choose to clean it. You can choose to replace it. I love it. That's so good. Or smash it. Yeah, exactly. Smash exactly. Right. We have choices. What? Uh, who was your first attitude coach? Hmm, I guess it would be my mother. <laughs> really? Tell us what what was her, what is her name and why was she your first attitude coach and what did she teach you? 
Uh, well, my my mom's name is Pat, and she just wasn't somebody that would allow me to have excuses about why I wasn't doing something. Mm. You know, she she really made me realize that I could determine the outcomes by the behaviors that I was willing to exhibit. And she was she was tough. <laughs> she did not. She did not. Uh, you know, allow me to make excuses. I love it. And now, so I, you know, I internalized that because then I was like, okay, well, I, I know mom's going to make it hard on me if I, if I try to wiggle out of this, so I might as well just do it right the first time. No, I know you mentioned you have a kid, so that's probably tough news for your son. Is that correct? How many kids you got? And do you say I have three, you got I have three, three kids. and you ain't yeah. taking no excuses from them. Correct. Yeah, true, true. I, you know, my, my goal, and this is something I teach a lot in, in coaching, my goal is to balance support and challenge. Ooh, you I know, like I, I'd say that if my mom made any mistakes, it's that she provided a lot more challenge than she provided support. <laughs> um, but it made me tough, you know, yeah. like I'm, I'm tough. I've got grit. Um, but it also didn't always feel great. And so I really try to balance that challenge, mm -hmm. but also support, right? Because when you, when you're able to do that and then people can learn to stand on their own two feet and they feel like they've got ownership over their own accomplishments and they have choice as well. And that, and that to me is what's most important is for people to feel like they can, um, they can actually achieve the things that they decide that they want in their lives. And so, uh, how old are the three kids? And then what are your one, two or three tips to create or to communicate the um, balance between supporting them and, uh, you know, telling them to let's get going? Um, well, my kids are 24, 22, and 17. Oh, so, they're almost gone. You know, You're almost done. Yeah, just <laughs> almost, almost gone. And then I think that uh, the, the tips are to – to pay attention, right? And to leave space for them and to observe, mm. you know, because I, it, one of the things that I learned about, I mean, early on about being the mom of three kids is that each one is different. And I thought after having my first son that, oh, I've got this parenting thing down. <laughs> and then I had my second child and he was colicky and, and <clears throat> very, you know, knew his own mind, obstinate. And my first son was pretty easy. And, right. And my second one was different. I you call know, it, I call it second kid worse. syndrome. Second kid. <laughs> you're not the only one. That, and I love my second child, Anthony, what's up? But anyway, I do agree with you. The second one sometimes can be a little bit tough. All right. And then the third one was what? My, my third one is a girl. So I had two sons and a daughter and <clears throat> she's been, pretty self-sufficient since infancy. I mean, she was one that like slept through the night and, you know, she's hardly been ever sick at all. Um, so she's pretty self-sufficient, you know, but it's just a matter of, you know, some guidance here and there and she's you know, the, sometimes it, encouragement. Yeah, sure. And she's the only one left at home Are the other ones gone or uh, are they still hanging around a little bit? My uh, oldest just went off to graduate school in at Syracuse. Oh wow! And my middle one is still home. He's uh, he actually made a decision recently to stop going to college and to switch his focus to learning how to code. So he's in a coding boot camp right now. Sweet. And um, and then my youngest is a senior in high school, and she's. Um, applying to colleges. So when you think about uh, being in, in their age from 18 to 25, what do you think about the world is different uh, between you, when you went through that and what you're doing now? And, mm -hmm. and, and my guess is you probably don't coach, besides your kids, a lot of people that are young. Um, but what are, what are your younger coaching clients coming to you with in, in terms of problems or challenges or needs? Well, to answer the first part of your question, I think that the biggest change from whenever I was 18 to 25 is that there was no internet. Mm. There was no social media. There were no cell phones, right? It was a completely different world and you had to learn different skills, right? I mean, and you had to take risks, quite frankly, that you don't have to worry about now, right? you know, like just driving someplace, you know, 
you had to make sure you got the directions, right? Right. Where you had to stop and be willing to be like, hey, I'm lost. How do I get to this place, right? Now it's like people are, it, it's interesting because I think that there's a real balance uh, these days between self-reliance or, or reliance on technology and um and independent or i don't know if that's what i meant to say well but, tech or tech um, tech reliance right right yeah tech tech reliance like when that's we were right. lost so, we, know, we, we, used we don't to have, have to internalize things we don't have to learn a lot of things actually because everything's right there in our supercomputer in our pocket mm-hmm. yeah we used to have to pull over put a quarter in the phone <laughs> call and go i don't know where yeah. i am i mean really I think it co- I think it made us be a little more adaptable and we had to, we had to learn things and maybe learn some resilience that people now don't have to learn. And I think a lot of times people are lost if they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I don't have any internet service on my phone. (laughs) They're completely lost. I cannot live. I can't order food. They haven't developed that problem solving ability to be like, oh gosh, what do I do now? But you know, when when I was 17 and I ran out of gas on a back road, I had to go to somebody's house and ask them, do you have any gas I can borrow? Yeah. Or can I call my, my mom? I didn't want to call my mom because she would have. They, they, but... they wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. They wouldn't think to knock on a door and ask for gas. Right. Just because they haven't ever. Right. Yeah. You know, they just always call people. Let's talk yeah. about, let's talk about this book called winning the game of work. That's certainly based on an attitude, I would think, right? That that's like mm-hmm. gotta be. I my favorite saying Zig Ziglar used to say was, "You don't have to love your job, but you gotta love the way you do your job." And that's something that we always talk with our people about that we coach and when we speak. But number one, why did you write the book, "Winning the Game of Work"? I think it's a very compelling title, and I think, quite honestly, it's a really great topic for people that are listening right now, because I think 80%, and you may know better than me, 75 to 80% of the people who are employed are not happy at work. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not happy with their culture. So tell me, why did you write the book? And then tell me a little bit about what it's about. What what does it solve? Well, when I first got out of college, I'm I'm a first generation college graduate. My dad was in a labor union, worked for the telephone company. You know, he and my mom was a stay at home mom until she got a job at the post office. So they did not have to, you know, go into the corporate world and figure out how do you get ahead here? But I was very keen to do that. And I was a good student in school. I thought that, oh, if I just use the skills that propelled me to be successful in school in the workplace, that I'll be successful there too. And it did not take me long to figure out this is a whole different scenario. And I suppose just being pretty persistent and curious that I I started really observing what was going on around me and trying to figure out, okay, this isn't the way I thought it was going to be. So what do you have to do to be successful and to get ahead in the workplace? And so I read a lot of books every, since the beginning of my career. Um, I was lucky enough to have some mentors that in some ways pulled back the curtain and started pointing out things to me that I was missing. And as I rose to become a manager and a leader, I really wanted to share these insights with people that reported to me and people that I was mentoring because you know, when you've struggled with something and then somebody actually shines a light on what you actually are need to do. Um, I just wanted to share that with people. And really the, the seeds of the book started around the time that I was considering leaving the corporate world. And I was just thinking back over my career and lessons that I had learned. And I just decided to start blogging and I blogged for a couple of years on my website And at some point, somebody pointed out that I probably had enough words for a book. And so that got me thinking like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should write a book. And uh, it just around that same time, somebody told me about about a book writing program that they were going through. So I, you know, brought all my words, I had about 25,000 words, and I brought those into the book writing program. And that was the seeds of the book. And really, my motivation for writing it is to make it easier for other people so that they're not falling on their face and becoming frustrated and starting to doubt themselves because they don't even realize then that they're in a game. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's what happens a lot of times is that many of the things that you need to do to be successful in the workplace are very counterintuitive in terms of like how you 
interact in other relationships, whether it's school or within your family or among your friend group. And it can feel awkward to learn these skills. And so I wanted to teach people. And I provide a lot of examples, both from my own career, people that I've coached. I interviewed 11 people for the book about their career journeys. You know, and I really wanted to be inspirational and instructional so that people can say, wow, I recognize my situation. And now I can kind of get a little more perspective and understand what options that I have that maybe I haven't thought about to get a different outcome than what I've been doing. Yeah, I love that. So let's dive into some of that. Tell us how you're able to get recognized for your value on the job, right? There's people that are in their job. I hear it all the time. They don't value me. They don't value me. Yeah. So what's the what's the solution? How do you get recognized for the value on your job? Well, first of all, ask what is valued? Because sometimes we can think oh, well, you know, I plan the departmental birthday parties, like that's valuable, you know, but listen, the way that I look at it, and I mean, I think that this is really true of for-profit businesses, that there's only three very basic ways to add value in a business. You are helping them make money, save money, or reduce risk. It is all about growing the top line and reducing the bottom line so the company can be productive and, and profitable. And I think a lot of people don't really connect the dots between what they do and how it supports the objectives of the business. And the closer that you can align yourself with how you're adding value for the business, the more it's going to be valued. And I think a lot of times people don't step back to say, could we improve this process? Or is there a way to innovate in a way that's going to, you know, I see things. Can I raise my voice to let them know that there's an opportunity here? That is truly adding value for a business. Coming in and being on time every day and turning in your reports, like, yeah, that might be part of your job, but that might not necessarily be adding value. And it's important to kind of step back and get the perspective. And maybe I always say to my clients, if you see something, say something. You know, because you're in a place where your perspective, nobody else has your exact perspective. And you may be seeing something that could be very important for the business to take into consideration. And, you know, even if we're not in a, you know, quote unquote leadership role, we can lead from anywhere within the organization. And that means, you know, if you've got a good idea, let people know about it. If you see a gap, in how things could be done better, step in and do that. I like you know, it. Event, eventually, it will be recognized. You might have to overperform for a while at the level that you're at, but if you, you know, quote unquote, play the game, right, you're going to get credit for it. I love it. I love it. She, she I, said gap. She did, did you catch say that? gap. Yeah. Well done, girl. <laughs> Nicely done. I always tell people when they go in uh, for an interview or whatever, your only goal with an employer should be to increase their profitability and increase their productivity. Yes. And, and I think if an employer hears those two words, they go, oh, that's somebody that, you know, I don't care what the job is. Everybody yeah, wants to make uh, more profit absolutely. and everybody wants to become more productive. So you touched on a little bit about, um, you know, the value that you bring. And, and this gets into this idea of, you know, like what's your superpower, which is in your book. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about how do I, how, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't have any superpowers. What, what do you, how do you coach people to find their superpower and, and what does that mean to you? Well, there's a saying that I have, which is you can't read the label from inside the bottle. We are walking around doing the stuff that we do. And often the things that come easy to us and that we're good at, we don't value. And we'll just say, oh, everybody can do this. You know, this is actually one of the things I see a lot with um, people who are managers or leaders is that they will make the assumption when they're leading people that how those people would react to the situation. Like they would say, well, I would do this. So naturally, anybody else is going to do that, too. And I'm like, uh, first of all, if everybody was reacting or responding the way that you do, they'd be sitting in your seat. OK, so you have to recognize, again, that there 
is probably a gap between what your knowledge and what your strengths and talents are and the people that you're leading. And you have to have that self-awareness to say and to appreciate and value yourself, you know, and it's not always easy. And a lot of times people that are in um, leadership roles or, or providing value in the company, like they're humble and they just think, oh, there's nothing special about me, but it's important. Like if you don't value what's special about you, other people aren't going to do it either. You know, and sometimes you might have to really point that out like, hey, you know, this is what I did. I got gotcha. you. And so when you talk about those managers, right? And man, there are plenty of bad managers out there. Yeah. <clears throat> I know you address and you talk about um, how to cope, right? So how do you cope with a bad manager who goes, well, mm-hmm. you should just do it the way I do it. And you're like, no, the way you do it sucks, number one. And number two, that's yeah. not me. How do you cope with them um, without getting fired? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, there's, there is such a thing as managing up. It's funny. I was, I was working with somebody recently and I used the word managing up and they're like, Oh, I never heard that before. I haven't either. <laughs> like, nice. really? I like term. Great term. Yeah. Well, you know, bottom line, you're right. Not every manager is a good manager. And unfortunately many organizations do not teach management. So people who are entrusted with managerial roles, a lot of times are modeling their behavior on the terrible managers that they had. And, you know, they do not understand what they're doing, or they don't, they don't really see the impact that they're having, they may just be managing the same way that they were managed. And if you are in a role, and there are expectations, and for whatever reason, it doesn't seem like you and your boss are seeing eye to eye, you can manage up and you should manage up. You should go and ask them for what you need. If you need clarity, you know, if you need to, you know, go and sit down with them and say, like, you asked me to do X and I thought I did that. Can you give me some feedback on what I can do better? Like it's incumbent upon you to get what you need to be able to do a good job. And now sometimes there are bosses who, you know, can't or won't, provide that feedback. In those cases, you can sometimes triangulate, you know, you can, you can maybe talk to a peer who's in another department, or you can find a a mentor within the organization that can help guide you. Um, You know, those are, you know, you can take the information that you have and try to use that to get what you need. But it really is incumbent upon you to get what you need, because we can, play the victim card all day long and say, well, you know, this is why I'm not performing and it's not fair that I don't have a boss. Well, guess what? You know, nobody ever said work was fair, you know, and the people, a lot, there's a lot of people that get ahead that, you know, are facing similar challenges, but they're, they're, you know, resilient, they're creative, they're persistent. And each of us can do we can do that too, right? We can find a way to have a different outcome, but we may need to look at the situation differently. We may need to say like, the reality is my boss is not going to be a leader. And so how do I get what I need for me to perform in spite of the fact that they're not being a good leader? Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, when you think about all the people you've coached, is there like, what's the two biggest, um, issues that, keep recurring when you start a coaching relationship like what what do you Mm -hmm. what do you hear most often and what do you tell them about it well one of the most common topics that i coach people on is that you know i'm working too many hours i'm so stressed out there's not enough time in the day to do everything that i'm expected to do and what i like to help people see is identify leverage points where they can have more impact without working harder or working more hours in the day. And there's, you know, everything from being a, uh, a prioritizing, you know, because one of the things that I see often is that people are just, they're taking on their projects like gnats, right? Like they're just, as they're coming they're just swatting them away rather than saying, like taking a step back and saying, what is the most important thing that I should be working on? A lot of times people just work on the most urgent thing, right? And uh, that's not how you get ahead. (laughs) You know, you get ahead by 
saying, what is the most important thing? Where am I going to get the most return on the investment of my time and energy? Um, and it may end up that they need to just get comfortable with the fact that they're not, they're never going to finish their to-do list. Right. Right. <laughs> but, but you'll be forgiven for, you know, missing a meeting or not returning an email. If you work on the most important thing that, you know, is the great new product that's going to be announced, or you close that big sales deal, or, you know, you finish the project that's, that the CEO is interested in, right? Like that you'll be forgiven for missing a meeting or two, or, you know, missing a deadline on a smaller project if, if you get those bigger things across the finish line. So make sure that you're focusing on the, the important and not the urgent. Um, you know, things that are other uh, points of leverage are learning how to delegate, you know, for a lot of strong um, people who, especially those who have r risen from an individual contributor level to a manager, their first instinct when something's not going right is to jump in and do it themselves. And I hear it like constantly, it's just quicker for me to do it. And I'm like, no, when you're doing something that you could delegate to someone else, you are not doing something that only you can do. And a big mistake I see for people that rise Love into that. management is they are not mentally promoting themselves to the level that they've been promoted to within the organization. And, you know, it's, it's normal to feel a little intimidated or to feel a little scared about having to flex new muscles. But if you've been entrusted with more resources, you know, so that's more people or more budget or more responsibility, it is up to you to get the most return on, a, on that investment that's been entrusted to you. And it means that you're going to have to step outside your comfort zone. You're going to have to go back to being a beginner in many ways. Don't fall back into like, oh, it feels good for me to finish this project. If that's not the work that you should be working on, delegate it. And even if it takes somebody else two or three times longer to do it, it's probably cheaper for the company anyway, because if you're making two or three times as much as that person, you know, it's cheaper to have them do it than you, even if it takes them longer. Talk to us about culture. It seems like you're really into um, working with companies to improve culture. So tell us about that dream. Tell us about mm -hmm. what you're seeing. Why did you gravitate toward it? Were you from mm -hmm. a bad culture or, or what? Mm -hmm. But everybody wants to talk about culture. I teach on culture with the attitude stuff. So uh, give, us, give us a little culture lesson for our leaders and well, managers out there. Well, I, I think <laughs> it goes back to something I was just saying earlier, but it's, you know, having a good culture is about creating an environment that encourages people to step fully into their own potential to support the objectives of the organization. And that requires trust. It requires setting an extremely clear vision. It uh, requires putting the right people in the right roles and then trusting them to do those um, jobs. And I think that, you know, some of the things that I've just mentioned earlier about mistakes that I see people making, you know, at a managerial level, sometimes this goes all the way up to the CEO. Um, and a lot of times there hasn't, you know, people haven't developed the ability to sort of break down what they personally know how to do and train others to step up and do that. And I always say like, you can't rise any faster than the people underneath you do, right? So as a manager or leader, it's really critical to um, develop the people under you so that they can do more because then that frees you to do more, to innovate, to sell more, to, you know, whatever it is, you know, to come up with the ne next great idea. I see very often, and gosh, I see this so often, with organizations where they've got a really um, coercive way of managing, right? Like if they don't get what they need, and I, I was actually talking to a client this morning with it from, I would say it's pretty much a household name organization <laughs> that, and I, I mean, I have a very positive, you know, impression of this company, um, but she works there and, 
the way that things get done is through yelling and, you know, bullying. And I, you know, I'm always a little frustrated and surprised because, you know, when you're, when organizations are using this coercive style or dominating style of management, they actually are shutting down the people within the organization. You know, people can't be very creative when they're watching their back, when they're fearful that they're going to get fired, when, you know, every other meeting that they have with their boss is, you know, uh, a smackdown, right? That's, that's not a safe environment. You can't be creative if it's, if it feels dangerous. I think there's some manipulative management uh, styles that are out there, and I've seen it. Yeah. Um, and there's books out, and you know, the problem is there's a lot of books, there's a lot of information, a lot of different ways for leaders to go. Yeah. And uh, you know, an organization that uh, I was working with, um, they they would like uh, instead of just firing you, they would they would like. Um, you know, set all these goals and have accountability, accountability. And so, you know, every, like every meeting was, okay, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. And so yeah. they, I think they, I forget what they called it, but you know, I was just always a guy like, look, this isn't going to work. You're out of here. Uh, but some people, I think because of our laws and firing laws, yeah. right. They have to create this path to um, exiting that ha that is all documented. The performance uh, improvement plan, the PIP. <laughs> is that what they call yeah. it? The PIP. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. you know, you can tell when somebody's getting ready to get canned, but it takes them six freaking months and all yeah. kinds of negative. What's your thought on that? What do you tell people about PIP and, and, and that whole philosophy or what have you seen and, and what's, what's a way out of that? And, is it an effective way to run a company? I mean, hey, look at a lot of companies are very successful and that's how they do it. Well, I think a lot of times when people are put on performance improvement plans, there was probably never a good fit to roll to begin with. Right. You know, and, and I think a lot of times organizations want to, you know, blame the individual for not fitting into the box that they tried to push them into right. rather than recognizing that maybe it just wasn't the right fit to begin with. Like maybe they shouldn't have hired that person for the organ for that role. Or, you know, sometimes there's restructuring and they're like, oh, you know, congratulations, you get to keep your job, but it's going to be this other thing. Right. And maybe it's not a good fit to, to their, you know, motivational drivers or to their skill set. Right. I do think that it can be hard to come back from a PIP, <laughs> you know, cause I, I agree with you. I think a lot of times it's just about building the case to, you know, so they don't get sued. So they can say like, look, we gave her six months or gave him six months to, you know, get up to speed. And, um, you know, it's really about building that case more so than helping the person improve. And, you know, I, I hope, and it's, I know that this is not always the case that, um, that there've been conversations before they get to that point to give people feedback about what they need to do better. Mm. And I suppose this goes back to what I was saying earlier is that, you know, we're all responsible for our own jobs and for creating the value in exchange for what we get paid. Um, and like I was saying, uh, sometimes, you know, you're kind of in no win situation because your boss has abdicated responsibility for assigning work or they're not being clear or they want to throw you under the bus to, you know, hide their own incompetence. Um, but regardless of all of that, it is important for each individual to take responsibility for that as much as possible. Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes you just got to be like this. I'm never going to win here. Um, but, you know, it, it's up to you to figure out how do I add value. I like it. So we are with uh, author, executive consultant, and mm -hmm. coach Terry B. McDougal. Terry B. McDougal dot com is how you get her. I know you're working on a new coaching program or a new mm -hmm. group coaching program. Just uh, maybe talk to us a little bit about some of the nuggets uh, or some of the high points, or what are you trying to do with that? What, what's your hallucination that you hope it turns into? <laughs> well, hopefully it's not. Hopefully it'll become a reality. I, a I'm working towards it. It's it's going to be a weekly live 
presentation and maybe hot seat type coaching. Um, it's a community that will be on livespot.co. Oh. And, you know, I, I work with both organizations and individuals, but I've talked to a lot of people over the course of the last few years about coaching and not everyone can afford or wants to invest in one-on-one -on -one coaching, both from, you know, a monetary and time standpoint. But this is going to be a way for me to be able to share a lot of the lessons that are in my book, but also what I work with people on one-on-one -on -one to help people to kind of shift their understanding of what the heck's going on at work, right? I mean, so often people are like really confused and confounded about what they can do differently to get a different outcome and they feel really trapped. And, you know, my mission really is to help people expand that overlap between their professional success and their personal happiness. It's um, it's super frustrating when you're working really hard and you just feel like it's not noticed or that, you know, you just keep getting the same result no matter what you do. And often it's because people aren't seeing, you know, they're not like kind of peeling back the blinders to see like, oh, there's other, other options. Right. And that's what, it, that's part of what I'm trying to do with the coaching community. So that's cool. And, 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 uh, Ultimately, that's what I wanted to do with this podcast. Uh, it's season two, Innovators and Influencers. I know that you're trying to innovate the workplace. You're trying to be a leader and a thought leader when it comes to company culture. Um, and so when it's, I guess when it's also what I'm hearing is if you want to win at work, number one, you need to be aware. Number two, you need to speak up. Uh, number mm -hmm. three, you probably need to just have a positive that uh, maybe I'm, oh my gosh, you yeah. know what, this is... This is my job. Well, like I always say, it, my job is my job. The way I do my job is really the secret sauce. Yeah. Anything else that I may have missed for our listeners uh, on how do we win at work? Just anything real simple that I've maybe left out? Well, I think that, you know, just listening to you talk about what we've been discussing here, you know, the way I think about it is that if you want change, there's three things that you need to do. Um, the first thing is that you've got to get clear on what your goal is. And I see a lot of times that people will, they'll talk a lot about what is painful to them. And when I'm first talking to somebody in a coaching session, it's fine. We can vent, right? It feels, it hurts. So let's talk about it. But at some point we've got to flip the table and be like, okay, I've talked a lot about what I don't want what does ideal look like? What, what is it that I do want? Right. right. Because you can't go towards something unless you de decide what that destination is. Um, secondly, you've got to shift your mindset to believe that that goal is possible because so often when I'm talking to people, I say, well, what is it that you want? And they'll say, well, I really want to get promoted, but there's no way it's going to happen. You know, they never promote people like me, whatever that might be. Right. And we do that for a reason because we don't want to be disappointed. We want to protect ourselves from hurt and disappointment. That's natural. But guess what? If you say to yourself, that's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. So, you know, step out, recognize that you're resilient enough to take a couple hits in, you know, as you're moving towards your goal, but be open because when you're, when you are open, I've seen it. I've seen it so many different times. When you start believing it's possible, the planets will often align Amen. to help you get that. And then the third thing is you have to take action, right? Like the whole, you know, here people talking about manifesting, right? <laughs> like I, I've seen it happen, but it only happens if you take action, sure. right? You can't sit and be like, oh, I want this to happen and just think it's going to magically happen. So like get clear on your goal. Get your mindset into a place where you believe it is possible. Even if it feels scary, believe it's possible and start taking actions. And those actions can start with Googling something, calling up your cousin Sally and saying, hey, you work in this industry and I want to know more about it. Love it. It does not have to be like quit your job and, you know, move to New York or sell everything and move to India. It doesn't have to be that. It just <clears throat> take one small baby step towards that goal and then just keep going. So much of what baby we, steps. yeah, so much of what we talk about is grow or die, right? Attitude booster yeah. number seven. And there's no problem. There's no challenge. There's no boss that can overcome your ability to grow through it. And so mm -hmm. uh, when I always think about taking action, I'm always, it's, it's, 
it can just be as simple as getting the information. Now we're going to go ahead and close up our interview with you with this thing called Knowledge Through the Decades. I didn't warn you on this. <laughs> okay. But at the, end of all, at the end of our podcast, we ask you to tell us the attitude lesson as you have gone through life. The first one can be a little tough, but I'm sure you can handle it. And so uh, whether it, it's you, if you remember when you were born, or maybe there was an attitude lesson you learned as you were giving birth, what is the attitude left lesson of birth, the beginning of life? Huh. Well, my mom was actually 16 years old when she had me, wow. and my dad was 21. And, you know, I can't remember all the way back to birth. <laughs> But I do know that my parents were extremely young. My dad took a job that moved us 40 times by the time I was 11 years old. Wow. And so the lesson that I learned from very early is to be adaptable, Amen. right? I mean, I had no choice. I, I literally didn't. I remember crying all the time, you know, like whenever I was... I went to a different school every year between kindergarten and fifth grade that in different states. Crazy. It wasn't like, okay, it's... It is crazy. It's insane for me. <laughs> I hardly believe it, but I lived through it. Um, I don't really remember a lot of it from, you know, before school started, but I do remember my mom telling me and, and you know, being extremely sad about having to leave my friends. But what I realized, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, the superpower, I didn't give myself credit for how adaptable and courageous I am because I had to face fear constantly as yes. a child going into a new school, not knowing anybody, but I learned to pick up on things that other people don't see, mm. right. To see patterns to, I've got a really good sense of direction. And maybe part of it is just from like having to go to a new school every year and figure out like in my mind, how do I like figure out what the diagram of the school is so I can find my way around. Um, so there's not, uh, too many curveballs that, that you haven't seen, me. right. That you haven't hit. So, um, yeah. that's like traumatic and unbelievable. 40 different, you know, that's just crazy. Yeah. yeah. What was the job? He worked on a construction crew for AT&T that was burying the long distance oh, cables throughout the Southeast. So they would be construction projects that might be a couple weeks, they might be a couple months, right. but we lived in a trailer. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, maybe when I was an infant, my mom was at home with her parents. And then eventually I think they realized like, okay, well, what can we do to accommodate this lifestyle? And so they bought a trailer and my dad would just hook it up to his pickup truck and we'd move from, you know, trailer park to trailer park. But that allowed our family to stay together. And his job was a better paying job than one if he had been in one place, you know, so they were willing, I, I suppose that's another lesson that I learned from my childhood is just, I mean, when you're a child, you don't know that it's weird that your mom had right. to drop out of 10th grade to, <laughs> to give birth to you. You don't know, right? right? You just think like, Oh, this is what you do. And they were like really resilient goal oriented people that it. were like, you know, this is what we want. And by the time I was in second grade, they, uh, or third grade, they bought a house and they flipped it. It was the seventies. They flipped the house. I remember us moving, like moving into this house. It looked like a bunch of hippies had lived into it before they, there were like posters glued to the wall. The kitchen was purple and red, but they, they renovated the entire house themselves. Mm. And so that was another lesson that I learned that if you set a goal for yourself, and you have a strong vision and you're willing to work hard that you can make incredible things happen. You know, that's some, that is actually a vision from seeing my parents do stuff like that, that has stuck with me. Wow. You know, I know it's possible. Yeah. That's so cool. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and let you give up uh, on being 10 unless you remember something specific in the fifth grade that really shaped your attitude or changed your attitude or affected your attitude there was an attitude lesson at 10 you can tell me but if not if we covered it then let's move on to 20 when you as you said was were a first generation college student do you remember being 20 mm -hmm. what was the attitude lesson at 20 um yeah i'll, I'll skip to 20 because i feel like the first things i talked about were like probably zero to ten yeah you covered um, it at 20, you know, it's so interesting because I went to the College of William and Mary in Virginia, oh, which wow. I was so, I was so naive. I mean, you know, I was, like I said, a blue collar girl. I was really good in school, you know, and so 
and I was really, really involved in school. Um, but I got into this, you know, second oldest university in the country, early decisions, only place I applied. And I was there with, you know, people like Colin Powell's son and, wow. you know, somebody who I, I didn't know who any of these people were, <laughs> you know, but here I was among people that, you know, are influencers the, the, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And and I think like Michael Powell, I was in school with him. I think he went on to be like some pretty senior level exec or, you know, leader within the government, you know, like maybe the head of like the, I don't know, some, with some department and, um, you know, like people from the Coors family and, you know, just really, but I was so clueless. I didn't, I didn't think that there was anything special uh, about me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think just learning lessons of, I don't know, just showing up and, being able to just figure things out and be exposed to things that I hadn't been exposed to before, you know, it, it really opened my eyes up to, to possibilities in life, you know, mm. just to, and also to realize that, you know, if you just show up and you're curious and you want to take action, like you can really make things happen. And, and also that, you know, people are willing to, to help you. You know, and, and I think that that was something that I really thought that I had to do everything on my own. Uh, cool. I wish that that was a lesson that I had learned earlier is to, you know, be a little bit vulnerable and to actually ask for help because mm. the lesson that I thought, and, you know, I suppose it's a double-edged sword. I think that every, I actually say to people that I think that people's greatest weakness is their greatest strength overused. Yes. And you know, to be self-sufficient is a good thing. That's a strength. But if to not ask for help when you can use it is a weakness. Right. Well, and it can affect your attitude too. So gappers, I want you all to just think about right now, who can you go ask for help about whatever problem there is? And if you want to improve yeah. your attitude to sit on a problem, to sit on a problem and fester and let it compound and let it own you, when you know that there's answers out there, when you know that there are people that care enough about you to talk about it, uh, let's use Terry's advice. And you know what? Let's make just a commitment or an intention to go ask somebody for help in the next 24 hours. I think your attitude will improve. How about when you were 30? Tell us about when you got to 30 and what your attitude lesson was there. Actually, can I just throw one thing into to what you just said to the gappers. Yes. You often are giving a gift to someone when you ask them to help you because much like my situation, I struggled a lot. And if I can help somebody else not to struggle so much, it's a gift to me. Yeah. It makes me feel like it was worth my struggle to be able to help someone. And I think a lot of people look at that and think that, Oh, this is a burden. It's like, no, people want to tell their story of how they got, they got to where they are and, and what they can do to help you, you know? So just keep that in mind. You might actually be giving somebody a gift if you ask them for help in the right way, you know? I love it. Um, That's great. When I was 30, let me think, like, when was I 30? Oh, okay. Um, I actually quit my job when I was 29. That I just quit it and went Good. back to business. I went back to business school full time. And uh, the lesson that I took from that is that I was sitting at this job. I was doing well at the job. I'd worked there for about four and a half years, but one of my, my closest girlfriend at work got married and she moved away and I'm sitting there at work and I'm realizing I, this realization came upon me that everything was going to change around me. And if I didn't do something to change it, that I might wake up one day and be like, where am I? Like what happened? You know, like I could feel it starting to change. And so I, it was 1993 and I picked up the phone and I called University of Maryland and I was like, when's your deadline for the MBA program? <laughs> it was like May. And they said, uh, Friday, I mean, literally. And this was before, you know, you could just go online and get an application. I called my boyfriend, who's now my husband. Um, and I, he, he was actually going to school at University of Maryland. And I said, can you stop by the business school and pick up an application? And he did. I got in. And uh, by August, I was doing trust falls and orientation oh my <laughs> with gosh. my class. And I did not know how I was going to pay for it either. 
But sure. I figured it out. Yeah. You know, and so I, I think that, you know, taking bets on yourself and when you realize that things aren't the way that you want them to be, do something. Right. Take action, like we just yeah. talked about, right? Yeah. So I think the attitude lesson is take action. Now, gaffers, I mean, she's not saying go quit your job and go get an MBA and not know how to pay for it. But you know what? If you're in a place where you're not happy, bet on yourself and do it. That's an awesome story. Are you? Can full- I, go ahead. I, I, like I told you when we started, I can talk about this stuff. The big lesson that I learned is that if you want something, put your foot on the path and start walking. There, w- There's curbs. You can't see around the corner, but you're never going to see around the corner unless you start. Mm. And, you know, what I learned in that was that, you know, I got an assistantship, which gave me some free credits and gave me discounted credits. My boss at my job gave me freelance work. I got a loan. I figured it out. Sure. But I never would have known about some of those resources had I not started. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's just so good. And now you're 40. I'm guessing this is mommy (laughs) time. Um, Tell me about your attitude lesson at 40. Well, my youngest child was born when I was 39, like a few months before I turned 40. Um, and you know, I, it's funny cause I, you know, a lot of people, it's like kind of a crisis when you turn 40. I wasn't thinking about that at all. Right. I had three kids, I had a right. job. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that during that time it was just, it was just enjoying the sweetness of the family that we had created um, and learning how to balance all of that. Now, I will say that when I was 41, I ended up getting uh, a big promotion after uh, a pretty humiliating failure. (laughs) Really? Well, I mean, we got to know. Tell us about the failure and tell us how you got the promotion. Yeah. So I was kind of, uh, I worked in marketing for a large bank and my boss, I was kind of the right hand person to my boss who ran marketing for one of the divisions. And, you know, he relied on me very heavily for, you know, helping him to strategize, to develop communications and so forth. He ended up leaving the company. And I said to myself, you know, I think I, I worked there for about eight or nine years. And I, I said, I think I'm ready for to step up. Um, and so I applied for his job. I didn't do anything special. I was just sort of like, stupid. (laughs) I just thought, Oh, everybody knows me. They know I do a good job. I've worked here for a long time. And I got through the first interview, uh, with HR. And then the second interview was a panel interview with colleagues that were in a different city. And I didn't, I didn't do anything to prepare. I just went in. I was like, Hey, you know, Hey, you guys all know me. You know, I bombed. I just bombed. I was nervous. I had not thought through the things that I actually teach my clients now about, like, think about how you add value. I was, I was the person walking around in the bottle, not being able to read my label. I wasn't thinking about how do people see me? How do I influence how people see me? How do I explain the value that I add? And so I got eliminated from the process. But I said to myself, that hurt so bad that I think there's something called a career coach. You know, this is like the early 2000s. And so coaching wasn't as big of a thing, but I knew that there was something like that. So I found somebody in my community and I worked with her for a few months. And weirdly enough, uh, they went through the whole process to fill that role. And the person they offered the job to turned it down. Oh my gosh. And so they started all over. And I was like, well... I guess I'll throw my hat in the ring again. I don't know if I'm a glutton for punishment or whatever, but I just was like, okay, whatever, I'll do it. They might not even interview me, but but they did. And this time I showed up very differently because I had practiced how do I talk about the value that I add. I went out and I bought new clothes so that I looked like a leader. I mentally promoted myself to this role. And um, my last interview was another panel interview with the CEO of the division and his two top executives. I remember clear as day sitting in his like top floor executive conference room. I was very confident. I was, you know, like, Bob, you know, this is, I, I, I was doing what I think that I needed to do to be seen as a CMO. Um, unfortunately, it was me and an external candidate and they offered the role to the external candidate. Um, and that hurt, but it, I played to win that time. And so I didn't feel as bad 
because I knew I did my best and they just, you know, made a decision. Maybe they wanted some new blood, but you know, we were talking about the planets aligning the day I found out I didn't get the job. I went to lunch. And when I came back, there was a voicemail on my phone from an executive recruiter. And over the course of the next say three to four months, I interviewed with several companies. I got two job offers and I was actively interviewing with for a third job. And I took one of those job offers that I got. It moved my family here to Chicago. It increased my income to the point that we decided that my husband would stay home with our kids. And it really put me on a very different tra trajectory for my career. Wow. And so very proud of myself for getting up. I love it. That's right? so good. Yeah, that's so good. So uh, since I can do math, you have to be 50, but my God, Jason, the girl does not look 50. Am I wrong? Are you, you are. You are not wrong. Are you 50? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh I mean, my, uh, my next yeah. milestone birthday is not that far away. Oh, well, I can't take you to 60 <laughs> if you're not. But so let's just go ahead and tell us what your attitude is. Um, lesson was at 50? Um, let me think. Let me think. What was, what was my attitude lesson at 50? Um, gosh, it's, it's hard to Where were you? Where, remember. Where were you yeah, working? Well, I was working. I was Did working you have a birthday party? Yeah. Yes. Actually, we went to the Dominican Republic for, to go. celebrate. We had a, we had a birthday party at my house and then my husband and I and some friends went to the DR to celebrate and it was awesome. It was fun. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that at that point, it was really sort of like hitting my stride as a leader. Mm. And, you know, I had learned the lessons, you know, that I coach on now and that I wrote about in my book. You know, I, I really was looking at work as a game. I was realizing that the disappointments or the, you know, the times that you're not getting what you want or even when you're getting feedback, that it's not personal. Yeah. Right. I mean, I was really just playing it like a player, not like oh, you're rejecting Terry or you don't like me or anything like that. I was like, whatever. It's right. a job, mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of reasons why people do the reason the things that they do. You know, I, I really try to help my clients to, you know, stop and look at, well, get to know the players that you're playing with in the game, right? Yes. Think about things from their perspective, like what's motivating them. That was kind of probably one of the biggest surprises that I had in my career was to, you know, start to recognize that people have different reasons for why they do what they do. And sure. it's not all about necessarily about doing the best thing for the company. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people that are really self-serving or, you know, maybe there are things that I'm not seeing, like they're in a meeting with senior leadership and they have information that I don't have. Right. Right. And it's so easy for us to judge and, and, you know, I think if we can stay loose and stay agile in the way that we see things yeah, and not, and, and very importantly, not to take it personally, right? Like if, if you're, there's a disappointment or you're getting some feedback that you don't like, like stand with yourself, support yourself. I love it. You no. Know? That, um, that's killer advice. That is <laughs> such, such good advice. And you can just see as we did that exercise, who you were and who you've become and i um, so excited for you i'm so happy that you came to the get attitude podcast i think you've dropped some great information on our people i think you've dropped some great information on how they can succeed better at work uh, and yeah. how to take action so i guess you know just on a personal note or as a motivational it's time for you to put on a motivational speaker's hat now if you want What's, yeah. your, what's your message to our gappers for the future? We always just like to give you guys the final yeah. word on, you know, what's your message of hope? What's your message of positiveness for the folks that are listening for their life and their professional lives, if you want to say something? Yeah. What, what I want to say is that to every listener out there, you are worthy and recognize that you came to earth with unique gifts that nobody else has. And your purpose here on earth is to figure out how do you use those gifts, okay? And, and don't, don't be defined by your job title or anything like that. Like, just know that you're worthy and stay on that path to find your purpose. I love it. Terry Boyle McDougal, you are awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> For coming on the Get Attitude Podcast, we will be seeing you on the next week. 
And we look forward to uh, having you go to TerryBMcDougal.com and checking her out. This is Glenn Bell signing off for the Get Attitude Podcast.